Okay, so chapter 14 is about how fast chemical reactions occur, how fast chemical reactions occur. Now, there's a special word for it, and that, ha that word is kinetics. Chemical kinetics is referring to how fast reactions occur and how reactions change over time, okay? And this is a very important part of chemistry because uh, as you alter things about chemical reactions, uh, those, alter, the, the, those changes manifest themselves often in the kinetics. So you can monitor how fast the reaction is occurring, make changes, and see how that affects the reaction. Okay? So, if we think about a chemical reaction, let's say here's a chemical reaction where we have A, some chemical, and that chemical is just becoming chemical B. All right? And if we looked at it like uh, a movie, so the beginning of the movie, you just have A. But then, as the movie proceeds, some of the A becomes B. Now, this reaction doesn't occur all at once, where everybody's A, and then all of a sudden, everything becomes B. In this reaction, you have an amount of A, indicated by the five red dots in this first film square, right? And then one becomes B, and then another, and then another, until eventually they all become Bs. Right, that's how chemical reactions generally occur. It's not all at once, it's uh, gradually over time. If you monitor their concentration over time then, all right, so we can look at this graph here. If we monitor the concentration of A over time, and this is red line is A, and if one represents a mole fraction or you know all of it, all the material being A to start off with, and none of it is B to start off with, the relationship between the amount of A versus time, A decreases over time, the concentration, the amount, the moles of material, and B increases over time. And these curves uh, will mirror each other, not mirror each other, but reflect each other like this, right? Because uh, A is turning into B, right? And so the rate at which A disappears is equal to the rate at which B appears, okay? And this rate of reaction is expressed in uh, the moles that are being lost or gained, right? So if you're thinking about A, the loss of A per unit of time, or the gain, the moles of B that you're gaining, per unit of time, right? And there's a variety of things that affect a reaction's rate, how fast a reaction can occur. Um, generally, the reaction is not this simple, just A going to B. Generally, it's something like A plus B going to C and D. So we have two chemicals that are needing to react together. And this reaction, when two chemicals come and are reacting, they're coming in contact. They have to hit each other. A and B have to hit each other. And they don't have to just hit each other a tiny little bit. It depends on their stability, but if they're relatively stable, they might have to hit each other pretty hard to, to make the reaction occur, right? So we call that the bond strength or the general reactivity, right? A chemical that's reactive has relatively weak bonds, right? It has bonds, but it can be convinced to form more stable bonds other ways. All right? So these are, this is an example of something that will change how fast a reaction occurs. Uh, also, the ability for these things to come into contact with each other. If A and B can't come into contact with each other very well, then the reaction can't proceed very well. And we've talked about this only briefly, but we have talked about it before, where, for example, if A is, uh, in this reaction here, is a, a solid, and B is a liquid, and maybe this is our vessel 
where we're hoping this reaction will occur. So here's B as a liquid, and here's A, a pile of A here, as a solid, right? The reaction is going to be limited to the surface where A is interacting with B. All right? So there's a limit to the amount of chemical reaction that can occur often based on the amount of interaction that there is between A and B, so if there are different states. All right? Another thing, I don't know if you've ever seen a TV show, more so in the old days because everybody's realized that this trick doesn't, doesn't hold, but yeah, you might see it some days still. Here's a car, and I'm going to try to draw something here. Uh, Camille, we're playing Pictionary, and you're the one who's guessing, so you try to tell me what I'm drawing. I'm going to miss a car. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're going to set the gas on fire. <laughs> yeah. We're putting what? What is this? Fire? Yeah, a it's match? a match. <laughs> the match, right. I'm going to put a <laughs> match in the gas tank. And what's going to happen to the car? It's going to blow up. Well, that's what TV tells us, right? It'll blow up. Now, this is not something you're going to want to practice at home. But in reality, nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. And the same is true with uh, a container of gas. Even if you just take a, a container of gas and you drop a match in that container of gas, right, a match in that container of gas, you won't get a chemical reaction to occur. And the reason is, is because you have gasoline here and all of the evaporated gas molecules, there's, it has such a high vapor pressure there's so much evaporated gas that there's not enough oxygen. And for the gas to explode, what we're asking it to happen is we're asking C8H18 to react with oxygen. All right? And then they're hopefully going to form, if that's what you want to happen, carbon dioxide and water. Right? But dropping a match into straight gasoline doesn't indicate, it doesn't mean that there's going to be a significant amount of oxygen there, especially with something as volatile as gasoline. Okay? So, let's see here. This is a, a little video. Uh, Surface area affects the rate of a chemical reaction. Here we have some lycopodium powder. I'll put him on mute because I think I can talk better than he can. <laughs> but, uh, so we have something that's very flammable. And we put some powder right there. And uh, we have a flame here. And we take the flame and we put it on the powder, and the powder will flame gently, but relatively small amount. Okay? Is it because the powder is not reactive? No, it's because the powder, what we're asking it to do is react with the oxygen. So here, we're going to take the powder and we're going to pour it over the flame. Now, when this happens, we increase the surface area. So the amount of oxygen that's available to each of the little powdery particles changes, right? So, as we pour this stuff, we'll see that we get a different sort of reaction. Pour the stuff, please, Dr. Bob. Pour the stuff. Now I'm going to pour the stuff. There it is. Very good. So we saw a huge flame result simply because of the increased surface area. Okay? Excellent. So, surface area, uh, the physical state, all these things can alter the rate of the chemical reaction. The thing that alters the rate of the chemical reaction mostly, though, in our uh, chapter, and it, it is kind of indirectly related to this one here, is the concentration, the amount of stuff. When we talked about the uh, surface area, really what we're talking about is concentration because, like when we put the match into the, the tank, right, the reason it won't explode is because we really don't have any oxygen. There's no oxygen. So the concentration of oxygen is too low. So um, the availability is also related to concentration. 
Now, that's clear. The more stuff there is that can actually run into each other, then the more likely you're going to have a chemical reaction occur. All right? Uh, so concentration is the, the parameter that we concentrate or we focus on most throughout the rest of, of this uh, chapter. Now let's look at this little slide here, this little video here that kind of looks at concentration. So what we have here is we have yellow and blue, and you can think of these yellow and blue as um, an A and B, and they're going to react together and they're going to form a single product, which is C, and it's these black balls. So I have yellow and blue reacting, forming these black balls. Okay? So you can imagine them bumping around. Not all collisions, not all collisions are hard enough to result in a product. But the ones that do result in these black products. Okay? And you can tell how effective this chemical reaction is based on the speed at which, let's watch the replay, based on the speed at which these yellow and blues go down or the speed at which the black goes up, right? We can monitor the rate of the reaction by uh, looking at the concentration versus time of either of those parameters. Now, another thing to note that watch how the relationship between A and B changes, right? See how the amount of A's and the amount of B's are always going to be the same as the reaction proceeds. Why do you think that is, Sarah? Um, because maybe they need equal moles to create the product. That's true, and not, not no maybe about it, right? It says right here, 1A, 1B come together to form 1C. So you're not going to be able to consume an A without a B, right? There's no part in this reaction where we say, well, how about we take two A's this time and form the C instead of one A and one B, right? Because this is the stoichiometry, you know that the rate at which A is going to decrease is going to be the same as the rate at which B will decrease, okay? Now, while we're here talking about this subject, let's also think about this. If there's a different chemical reaction where we're combining D with two E's and we're forming F, right? If we do this, then the rate at which D disappears, how will that relate to the rate at which E disappears, Alyssa? The rate, the rate of E will faster because it needs two E? That's right. It won't just be faster, it will specifically be what? How much faster? Twice as fast. Twice as fast. That's right. So the stoichiometry in the chemical reaction then will tell us the rate, the relative rate of the disappearance, right? And also the rate of appearance for this scenario, right? So for example, if I said I performed this reaction here in this vessel. It was a fun reaction. It was one of my favorites, right? I monitored that E was disappearing at the rate of 6 molar per second. The concentration of E was decreasing by 6 molar per second. All right? E decreased its concentration 6 molar per second. Well then, Jace, I should be able to know at what rate did F appear? What do you think, Jace? At what rate was F appearing? If E was disappearing at 6 molar per second, are you there, Jace? Can you take a, a question? Yeah. Would it be the three? That's right. That's right. Because the stoichiometry is half as much, the rate at which this one disappears, this one appears half the rate, right? So simply looking at the stoichiometry there can tell us the relative rates of those chemical reactions, okay? 
So let's continue watching what we do here in this one. We're going to stop the reaction and we're going to change things. We're going to change the temperature. Now, how is this picture going to look different, Leata? If I ramped up the temperature, what is going to look different about this process now? What do you think, Leata? What is temperature? Okay, well, if we were to have lowered the temperature, then things would slow down. That's right. But we've increased the temperature. So as you mentioned, temperature is related to the motion of the molecules. So with an increased temperature, we're going to see that the molecules move around much faster. And because the molecules are moving much faster, then there's an increased uh, possibility of the given collisions to have enough energy to make the product. And so we see the reaction proceeds a lot faster. Okay? Very good. Now, let's see here. What are we going to do next? Next, we're going to stop that reaction, and now we're going to slow the temperature back down. Oh, this is really slow. Look how they set it up really slow. But this time, we're going to put in more B. Did you see that? Now we started off with Still 50A, but this time we have 100 Bs. What do you think, Camille? How is that going to change the rate of this reaction? Will they slow down? Do you think the rate will slow down because there's 100 Bs? Oh, wait, I feel like that's wrong. Speed up. You think it'll speed up because there's more Bs? So we. Well, we can look at the chemical reaction. We know that A has to come in contact with B to form C. So it's a still a one-to-one -one ratio. So the rate at which A and B will decrease will still be the same. But by putting more B in my vessel, do I increase the chance of every A finding a B, Camille? Uh, yes, because when there's that's right. So we would expect increasing the amount of B, even though stoichiometry is still just one to one, if you increase the amount of B, you would expect in the same vessel, right, the same size, you would expect the, the rate of the reaction to be faster. All right. And so we let it go and the rate is faster. Um, the concentration of A, whoops, the concentration of A here uh, changes. You see here, we start off at 50 and 100. Every time an A disappears, a B disappears, right? And so the, the numbers are disappearing at the same rate. We started with a lot more of B than we have of A. So um, it looks like we have not lost as much B, but we have lost the same number of Bs relative concentration, there's still more B left over, right? So what we learned here is that when you increase the amount of one of the reactants, then the rate at which the reaction will proceed increases. All right, we're going to do a few other things. One thing here is we're going to make uh, reactant one a gas and reactive two a solid, right? And what did that do when we, what does it look like this does when we perform the reaction, uh, Alyssa. Does it speed up or slow down the reaction? Um, I feel like that would slow down the reaction because there's not as much, not All as right. many molecules in it. Well, th that's right. Um, Anything, like it's that's right. The amount of exposure has decreased. Our surface area has decreased. Very good. Uh, so that's going to slow down the chemical reaction. What if we make it so that we have smaller bits of the solid. What do you think about that, Alyssa? Is that going to speed up or slow down compared to this one here? I think it will speed it up compared to the last one because they're more spread apart. But yeah. they still would be slower than them all being scattered. That's right. Very good. I accidentally clicked off it. So that's right. So it would be slower than this all being in the gaseous or aqueous phase, but 
uh, it'll be faster than just one solid chunk. Okay, very good. Excellent. So these are the factors that affect the rate of a chemical reaction. All right. So, um, what do you think? Which of the following would speed a reaction? Um, I think that all of these would speed up the reaction, right? If we dissolve a, a, an ionic reactant in water, that dissociates and spreads out all those ions. Uh, if we stir a reaction, that allows more interaction to occur. Um, now, stirring it won't speed up a reaction sometimes. So, for example, when we're reacting two gases with each other, they're already going to be mixed. Or if we're reacting two aqueous solutions together, uh, is, is the initial stirring is necessary to make sure they're mixed, but after that, stirring won't continue to help the process. Grinding solids, making more surface area. So we didn't talk about adding a catalyst, adding a catalyst. But a catalyst is one of the factors that will also change the rate of a reaction. Um, how it changes the rate of reaction is you probably have heard the right answer to this or at one point in your academic career. Um, but we'll get into the specifics of why catalysts help. We always say that catalysts lower the activation energy. That's a phrase that people can't remember what it means, but this is another opportunity, this, this chapter here, for us to, to review what that means, and, and we'll talk about that. But a catalyst, by definition, is something that speeds up a chemical reaction without being consumed itself. Something that speeds up a chemical reaction without being consumed itself. Okay. So, let's see here. Um, let's